Okay, so I untie it. All right, welcome everybody. As folks are kind of coming in here, um, we're going to get started in a little bit. But um, as you're coming in uh, today, if you wouldn't mind putting in where you're joining us from and what your favorite type of snake is. That would be great. Um, the chat is a little word bubble over in the corner there. Um, so as folks are kind of getting on today, if you wouldn't mind going over there and putting what your favorite snake is. You prefer Nebraska specific, I guess, but um, yeah, if you wouldn't mind going and doing that, that'd be great. All right, Mullen, Nebraska, and they like rattlesnakes, so yay! Somebody likes rattlesnakes. So yeah, as folks are coming on today, my, my name is Amanda. I'm an education specialist, so for those of you that are coming on a little early today, um, if you could, in the chat box, let us know your favorite snake, type of snake, and where you're joining us from. So we've got some people from Lincoln, we've got people from Mullen, and Alliance. All right. All right, yes. Oh, and Geary. All right, Bartlett. I know Bartlett. <laughs> Bellevue, all right. So yeah, come on in. Let us know where you're joining us from today and then type your favorite type of snake in the chat box. So my chat box is kind of down at the bottom. It's got a little word bubble on there. And then throughout the program, um, if you have any questions, um, we're gonna be typing them into that chat box um, until uh, the end. I know Dennis has um, allowed some time at the end for some questions. So as people are coming on today, oh, black mamba is somebody's favorite snake. That's intriguing. I watched an interesting documentary on black mamas. Um, I love, I love documentaries, by the way. So yes, come on in. Oh, Key Cobra, very nice. All right, a boa constrictor. Okay, so we've got all across the board. Um, yes, good job, bull snake lover. There, we just joined us from Iowa. So that is awesome. Hognose, yes, that is enough. I don't know if I could pick a favorite snake. That's like picking your favorite child, um, in my opinion. So I'm having a hard time coming up um, with my favorite snake. And I hear that my microphone is um, giving some feedback and breaking up a bit. Are other folks having the same issues with my lovely microphone? <coughs> Feedback, you say. I'm intrigued. Hang on. All right, friends, is this any better? Much better. Okay, good. Cool. Well, we got that kind of taken care of. I'm sorry about that. That is awesome that you were able to tell me through that chat. So now I am able to talk to you a little bit better. And I feel so oh, just to test, that. Amanda, how's my how's my voice come across? So I'll be standing it's, out here with the snakes. So a test one, two, three. How's my voice coming across? So we're hearing good, good from a couple different people here. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Okay, so we've got some people from Omaha, 
So yeah, as you're coming on today, if you haven't already shared your favorite snake, go ahead and type that in the chat box and then also let us know where you're joining us from today. Uh, they want to know if the snakes can hear it. <laughs> I don't know. We'll find out. Can snakes hear? Well, they, they want to he hear our, our, our lovely, yeah. Anyway. <coughs> oh, they, they have seismic. So the vibrations have to hit the substrate, then hits their body, goes through squamate bone, then goes to their stapes. So literally they hear differently than us. They feel vibrations which are translated. So they have not auditory, but seismic hearing. All right, so some of us are logging on. Um, if when you logged into Zoom, and what you can do is you want to use the computer audio. And so if when you logged in, you didn't have the choice for computer audio, you may have to, I don't want to say log back out and log back in, but that might be a way to kind of help with, with the audio. Um, and another one is to, to check your microphone. So thanks, Grace, for, for giving um, Josh some, some tips as well. Um, so we have quite a few people joining us here today or registered for this program. Um, so we'll give them a couple more minutes to kind of log on. I'm going to ask that we all stay muted for right now, um, just so that way there's not all this weird feedback and Dennis is, is able to come across really clearly. And then um, what we'll do is um, we'll kind of open it up. We'll use some chat boxes. Um, so if you can find the chat box, um, mine is down at the bottom of my page and it's like a little word bubble. Um, and then you can type your questions in there. And throughout the, the program today, I'm going to be um, making sure that those questions get answered either by myself in the chat or um, if, if there's time um, for me to kind of um, break uh, Dennis's presentation, I'll probably jump in and ask those questions as well for everyone. So um, if you have a question, go ahead and put it in that, that chat box. Um, like I said, we're going to have several people joining us here today um, before. Like I said, we get started. So I appreciate everybody being on time. We still have people rolling in to this snake program. Um, we appreciate you all being here and being on time. Uh, my name is Amanda Phillippe. I'm an outdoor education specialist out here in beautiful Western Nebraska at the Wildcat Hills Nature Center. I will be um, the, um, the bouncer for today, I guess. I'm gonna be Dennis's room monitor <laughs> for today. And so I will be um, working the chat so if you have any questions, put that in there. I will also be uh, making sure to, to look at um, the video and everything else that's being posted up there as well. So we want to thank you for, for joining us here today. We're really excited for this um, presentation. Um, we've got, like I said, quite a few people joining us here today. So that's good that we have several people that are excited about snakes and to learn more about our, our slithery friends here. So. I will go ahead and so, yes, Megan, I agree. I cannot choose my favorite snake. I feel like it's choosing your favorite child and I'm not willing to put myself in that position yet. So um, they're all pretty good. Josh has got his audio up working. And so we're gonna go ahead and kick it off. So let me stop sharing and I'll kind of hand it over to Dennis to do a little bit of some presentation. And then, um, like I said, throughout the, throughout the presentation, we'll sprinkle in a few questions here and there. Okay, so um, first off, my name is Dennis Ferraro. I'm a professor here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Been here for 30 years, so hopefully you see me if you're from Nebraska. I've had snake shows for all for gaming parks for the last 25 years. And at our labs here on East Campus, we have pretty much a gender pair of all the native snakes. And I'll be showing you some. I pretty much, since we're only going to be able to get to 10 to 15, I picked ones from uh, greater Nebraska and the western side. Uh, even though I'm right here now in Lincoln, last week I was in Sioux County. Three weeks ago, I was in Kimball County. And a couple weeks before that, I was in Brown County. So I do the whole state um, and do herpetological surveys across the whole state. 
So for, I'll be going back and forth between my screen and hopefully you can see this now. You ever see the share, Amanda? Yes, looks okay. great. You're smiling even. <laughs> okay, so we'll start off. So we have, I made a great website years ago. Um, we have a QR for it, so you can put right on your smartphone or you can just type in the URL into your device or your smartphone and you will have a field guide on your phone. Uh, for all the amphibians, turtles, and reptiles of Nebraska, along with the range maps and everything. You just have to put that URL on your phone. And also in there, if you see something and you've looked through all my pictures and my descriptions and you can't seem to find what you're looking at, take a picture of it with that phone and send it to Ask the Expert. It'll end up on this phone, mine. And then I'll go right back and tell you what it is. And right now, this time of year, I'm getting two a day. And I get county records and everything. So this is a great site for you. And if you, see, if you just want to report something, there's a page where you can put in your county, the GPS, and the picture. You have to always have a picture attached to it. And I'll be able to use that data if it's pertinent. So in Nebraska, we have 29 distinct different species of snake and they're in four families right now. We have five snakes that don't get bigger than uh, 16 inches, and we have our largest snake, the bull snake, which can get easily up to eight foot long. So we have a big range. Now, not all 29 are across the whole state. I'll show you different range maps for the snakes that I show you. And what we have more snakes in the southeast corner of the state, but we have a considerable number of snakes across the whole state. And as far as herbivora goes, or amphibians, turtles, and reptiles, we only have 64 of everything put together in the whole state. So we have 11 frogs and toads, we have 10 lizards, okay, 29 snakes, and we have a nine turtles. And all that together comes up to 64. So we're gonna talk about these things. And one thing I wanted to say, each one of these 29 snakes in Nebraska is a distinct species. Different chromosome number, it, they cannot interbreed. I mean, most of these snakes have a difference greater than my difference and a brown bat. So if you think a bull snake and a rattlesnake can interbreed, you must think I can interbreed with a brown bat. And if you think that, talk to me sometime. We have to discuss something. So each one of these is a distinct species of its own, just because they all look somewhat to us, they were as distinct as a mouse is to a gopher, or a dog is to a cat. That's how distinct each one of these species is. Okay, the first one we're gonna look at, and I'll stop sharing, is the smooth green snake. You notice all the snakes I'm gonna show you are gonna be in cloth bags. The reason is, in the cloth bag, the snake can um, breathe through it. It's soft, so it's comfortable. And then it, it's easier, it's the best way for the snake. The snake goes into a rest state being in the cloth bag. And then when I'm out in the field, I can just put them around my belt line. I'm just gotta make sure the rattlesnake goes in the back. So in case it bites through, I lose tissue where I want to lose tissue. You know, it's a great win-win situation. This is a full-grown smooth green snake. It's not a common snake. It lives in native prairies and eats insects. So why do you think we can't not find too many in Nebraska anymore? Could it be that we lost all but two or three percent of our native prairie? And just imagine trying to find one of these. It lays on top of the on top of the Forbes in the grass, sunny itself, and goes after insects. Now, as you did see, I'll share the screen one more time for you here. Okay. 
and you can see its range. So it's kind of spotty. So these blue spots are where we have DNA or samples, and it's very spotty. Most of um, the ones that we have are been from the big bend area of the plat up to almost towards Ord. We've had only one or two instances here, and then we have about four or five instances around Cummings County, up there between Cummings and Washington. So it's a fairly rare snake. Okay. And now. So we had a, a quick question about um, how it does it hunt? You said it likes to eat insects. Is it kind of one of those stalking predators or, or what is it? Yes, favorite it's, it's, a, it's a sitting weight predator. Okay, next we're gonna look at the Plains milk snake, which actually I say its range is across the whole state. Remember, the red dots is where the University Museum has specimens and we have pretty much a DNA sample. So if you look at these dots, remember there's 93 counties. I can't get to all of them, look for all the snakes, even in 30 years. So I would say this snake is pretty much across the whole state, but those that have red dots, it's probably more common. We will stop sharing. This is a full grown plains milk snake. And note that it could be bright red with a black and then a gray or a white or a yellow in between. Color does not tell a species for the most part. Color is like hair color, okay? We have redheads, brunettes, and blondes, and with snakes, we have variants of colors. So I've caught some with bright red and bright yellow. Now, does everybody know the saying? Red on black, which all the ones in Nebraska are red on black because they're all plains milk snakes. Red on black, wherever there's reddish, it's touched by black. Okay, it's a friend of Jack. Now, if you caught a coral snake in Texas or Florida, and they're only half this size, the red would touch the white or yellow. And they are the most venomous snake potent in North America, the coral snake, not this one, not in Nebraska, but in Florida and Texas. And that one is yellow on red, kill a fellow. Don't translate that to Spanish because in Mexico, that doesn't work. The milk snakes and the coral snakes have the same in Mexico. This one I caught in 2003. So it's a large one. We've had it for 17 years in the lab, and it was probably at least three years old when I caught it. And I believe I caught this one in the Sand Hills, probably Cherry County. But I've caught the other one we have, the female is from Jefferson County. And I think, Amanda, 2004, you were with me when we caught one in Dundee County at Enders Reservoir or Chase County. Sure, sounds right. I don't know what I had for breakfast today, Dennis. I can't remember that far back, but I know we went herping together, so. Yeah. Man, there was a student here before she became woefully employed. Notice the underside. So what's, what's the typical lifespan of this type of snake, Dennis? This one probably 20 to 25 years in captivity, probably 12 to 20. Usually it's 90% mortality for the first year or two. And then once they make it past the first couple of years, they're almost adult size or getting close to it, depending on the species. They can, it goes down to, you know, predation pressures. So. Our but other like anything, Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, go ahead and finish that, and then I have another question that talks about Like anything in the wild, it has, to do, it, it, it has to do with predation pressures and food. And nowadays, with our state being 80% agricultural, it has a lot to do with habitat uh, uh, availability, whether they're going to be able to find a place to live out their lifespan. 
that has enough food. So, go um, ahead, man. The other question was the, the more captive bred or store-bought, um, maybe milk snakes. Um, are they bred for those special colorations on them? Or are they selected for, you know, the unique, unique colors that they have? Yes. Um, you're hitting a sore spot here because I am 100% against the exploitation of animals. And what they do is they take these animals and they inbreed them to get these funny colors. So they're breeding brothers and sisters, line breeding them. And that comes with a whole array of problems. 25% um, will have problems that they will die. And they just throw those away and, and sell the ones that look nice for a higher price. So it's complete exploitation of animals. Now you cannot buy, sell, trade any native animal in Nebraska. That's against Nebraska Game Parks Commission regulation. And you can't take any native snake, no matter what it is, over state lines, even if it's over 21. Okay, you need a permit for that. So you cannot, so to speak, sell or trade the wild ones. You can keep one for yourself, okay, if you catch it, uh, certain ones, but you can't bar, sell, trade it, or exploit it in any way, because it's a, um, that comes under the 1942 public trust doctrine, because it's native. Things in the pet trade are inbred, line bred, and so there's a lot of problems with those. Okay. Next, we're going to go through three of the garter snakes. We actually have four types of garter snakes, but one is found on the east edge, and the other ones are found either statewide or on the west edge. The first one I'm going to show you is the plains garter snake. Okay, stop sharing here. Okay, the plains garter snake. As you can see, has a plane underneath. Now, the color of the stripes means nothing. You can have a plains garter snake with an orange stripe, yellow stripe, red stripe, blue stripe, cream stripe, you name it. I found them all. The difference between this one and the others, if you count the number of scales around the body, this one has 21. The other species has 17 or 19 around the middle of the body. They can't interbreed. This one has black sublabials, as you can see looking at the face. Look at its cheeks, and they have black stripes on its cheeks. Also, the sidebar is on scale row three and four. That's how we tell the planes from the common. Now, plains are more common in cities and towns, and commons get bigger and are more common in rural areas. So I'm going to put the plains back and show you the common. How long does it take them to reach full size? Garter snakes, if they're, they're born next week, in the next three weeks, and if they make it through the winter, it'll take about another two years before they're full size and section mature. Okay. Also, we really want to know if they can be purple. We have a six-year-old viewer that is really excited about maybe the possibility of a purple snake. Well, kind of like purple. I wouldn't say exactly purple, but they can get almost like purple. I've seen some bluish rose color, which can be taken as purple. So the next one is the common, again, across the whole state. And if you notice, it's garter snake, one word. That's the proper way to do it now. And it's not garden snake. There's no such thing in United States as a garden snake, they're in Europe, it's garter snake. And for the older people in the 60s like me, it was named after a woman's garter. For younger people, you don't know what I'm talking about.
This is the common. This one happens to have some more red on its side. Notice the scales are bigger. Only has 17 scales around. And the side row is on scale row two and three, not three and four. And virtually no big bars on the lips. This is a female, full grown. Notice how it's larger than that male planes. These guys not only eat worms and insects like the planes, but they love small frogs and minnows and small fish. That's it, work that camera snake, work it that way. And, and that was one of the questions um, about how we know uh, male and female. Um, I have to probe them, which I'm not going to do. Hi. Okay. And with and these guys, believe it or not, the teeth on a, a garter snake this size are larger than the teeth on an eight-foot bull snake. There's still only an eighth of an inch. But a bull snake doesn't need to need, need teeth because it constricts its prey. And I'll let you see those later. But this guy has to grab worms, rub them on the ground, subdue them, and swallow them whole. So it has, show your, oh, you almost showed your teeth. And another thing, can you see that tongue coming out? The color of the tongue is nothing. It's like some people are brunettes, some people are redheads, some people are um, blondes. The color of the tongue, could be black, red, whitish, both black and red, like this one. That's just genetics. It has nothing to do with gender, nothing to do with the species. Okay, we'll put this one back. Go to our next one. Okay, the next one is a terrestrial garter snake, only found in Sioux County, but three years ago, one, one only was found in Banner County at Bull Canyon. And that's the only one found out outside of Sioux County, Nebraska. So it's a fairly rare snake. And when you see on the screen SNC, that's one designated as species in need of conservation, and it is protected. So it's one you can't take out of the wild without a permit. And this is the terrestrial garter snake. Now, sometimes these have a black belly, okay? And they have about 20, 19 or 20 scale rows. It has a side very low, but they have a jagged line down the back. Yeah, you see that? Sometimes black belly, sometimes white, and this is the terrestrial. Only found in Sioux County, Nebraska. It's found in Wyoming, but Nebraska only in Sioux County. So our question, um, one of them was why your snake, your last snake was opening its mouth when it, it was smiling for the camera, uh, but it really wasn't smiling for the camera. But we, How do you we know what's smiling questions. for the camera? What data are you using to make that assertion? Well, I'm not giving it my feelings and thoughts. So yes. <laughs> right. Um, it's just it's just what it decided to do. It was probably um, that one didn't want to be held at that time, so it was just showing me, please put me down. And when so all snakes when they want to be left alone, they'll do two things. One of two things: they'll either open their mouth and strike open mouth it or they will rattle their tail. All snakes rattle their tail. Garter snakes rattle their tails. Bull snakes rattle their tail. It has nothing to do with them. 
all snakes rattle their tail. It's just that rattlesnakes put a thing on the end of their tail to make it sound better. But every snake rattles its tail. And then how can we how can we tell if a garter snake is gravid or has has young? Or I use my ultrasound unit. How, um, how would a normal person do it? <laughs> well, I can also palpate it. You can't really tell. Um, you can palpate it and you feel like pearls. Remember, they're live birth. They're viviparous. They're going to have live young. There's no eggs in there. So all snakes in Nebraska, either if their egg layers will lay their eggs in June and they'll hatch in August to September, or they're live bearers, they'll mate in June and they'll have their live garter snakes for the first at, at in August or September, October. Rattlesnakes are the live birth and they're the last. The prairie rattlesnake usually gives birth the first week in October. I call that the most wonderful time of the year. I'm always out there in the dog towns catching those babies as they're being dropped to tag them. It's, it's my happy time. Um, most people's probably not, but I'm... <laughs> It's your happy time. It's like Christmas for you, huh? Yeah, it's better, yeah. Okay, so let's see who's next. Oh, our water snake is next, so let me share the screen really quickly. It's found pretty much across the whole state, any place where we have water. And I'll stop sharing that since and this is pretty much the only water snake in the state. There is Graham's crayfish snake, but it's only found in two counties in the southeast corner. It's much smaller. This is the northern water snake, or sometimes called the common water snake. It can have a colorful belly. It can be black. It can have lines. It flattens itself out. This is a full-grown one, but they can be larger, of course. This is the average size of a full-grown water snake. They feed on dead, dying fish. So if you're fishing and you hook the fish, or you have a stringer of fish on your boat or dock, they'll come right up to you, okay? Because they love that. They are, there is no venomous water snakes in Nebraska. The farthest north a cotton mouth or water moccasin has ever been verified is the southernmost county in Kansas along the Missouri River. Or excuse me, not, it's not even south of the Missouri River. They're found south of the Missouri River in um, Missouri, and they've been found in the south east corner of Kansas. Only one county in Kansas, the water moccasin. But these guys are across the whole state of Nebraska. And you go, why can't they swim upstream? They're, every snake's a poor swimmer. They can maybe go 10 foot upstream, and they are out of energy, and they, they float back. So we can float our snakes to Kansas, but no Kansas snakes can come up here in the water. And no snake, I don't know the snake, and I put radio transmitters in hundreds of snakes. And I never found a snake that would go more than two miles in its life. Again, so the thing is, if you catch one of these, it's going to try to bite you, and then you won't it'll stop it from it'll, once it realizes that doesn't going to do anything. Next thing it does, it vomits up all the dead, dying fish it just ate on you as a defense. So if you're a raccoon, you drop it. If you're a herpetologist, you just smell bad your whole life. We did a project with 200 of these, and we had to collect their what they've been eating. And so it was great. We grab them, put a bag in front of them, and they puke up for us every time. So remember, if you go swimming, they'll go the other way, unless you rub dead fish on you. And that's how we catch them. I rub dead fish on my arms and go swimming, and they come right up to me. My friends go the other way, but the snakes come to me. They will flatten themselves out. And again, they can be bright colored belly or dark colored belly. So we're going to put the... Are there some other snakes that, that like to puke up their food, Dennis? Yeah, they are. We'll get to those. This one does it more than others, though. 
This one actually, I would call it projectile vomiting. It's the only one I've ever been projectile vomiting by. Ooh. The other one just kind of slowly vomit on you. This okay. one actually shoots it out at you. Okay, okay. Well, oh, one thing I forgot to show you. This guy is the only snake we have in Nebraska or in North America, this genus. Turn him out of his bag real quick. All snakes only have one lung. This snake's lung goes from here all the way down to about here. It can stay underwater for 20 minutes. I mean, all snakes can swim on the water. This is the only one that can go underwater and stay there hunting in Nebraska. So it, it's a great swimmer. So if you see a snake in the water and it dives and it goes down, doesn't come right back up, then you know it's a water snake. All snakes go in the water, but if they dive, they come right back up. So what would you recommend for somebody that maybe is in like middle school that wants to become a herpetologist? What would you recommend? Maybe some classes or things that they can do to kind of follow, uh, I guess, in your footsteps there? Well, let's just say be a better herpetologist than me. Um, study specialist sciences and math. Do well in math. And then when you get to be a freshman in high school, contact me in the university. We'll give you a tour. I recruit as early as eighth grade. Actually, I had a student years ago. I'll just talk about this really quickly. His name was Kyle O'Connell from Bennington. When he was a freshman in high school, he came to me and said, I want to be a herpetologist. I told him, do well in school. Come to me when you're ready to go to college. He came here, worked with me. He's the one who did the water snake project. Got his master's, went on to Texas, University of Texas Arlington, got his PhD, did some work as a postdoc in Indonesia on frogs. Guess where he is now? Herpetologist at the Sony Institute in Washington, D.C. And he started right here in this lab. So stick with me. I'll get, get you there. He'll get you in trouble too. If I remember correctly, he just tells you to flip over rocks and stuff and grab whatever comes out. So you gotta, you gotta watch him. Herpetologist, I tell you what. Okay. This next one we're gonna look at is more of the hog noses. And it's going to be the Eastern hog nose we'll look at first. And no Notice, even though it's the eastern hognose, we have two areas where we have the westernmost range of the eastern hognose. It goes all the way almost to the east coast. But we would normally see it in the oak savanna along the Missouri River, but it's also all the way to Valentine along the Niobrara, and it's also been found in Chase County at Enders Reservoir along the Republican. So this guy is common in several places in the state. It has never been found in dry areas. And the reason is it's, it's, it's an obligatory, what we call a neuron feeder, which means it only eats frogs and toads. You can try to force feed it mice and lizards, it'll die. It only eats frogs and toads. And that's all we feed it. Now, Tell you a lot about them. See the upturned nose? It uses that to push the toad out of the sand. Okay? Then, with its wide mouth, and it only has two teeth in the back of the mouth that are like two little needles back here. It grabs that toad. And you know what the toad? The toad does not want to be, the toad does not want to be eaten. So the toad puffs up. You ever see a toad puff up when you go to grab it? This guy impales a toad. A friend of mine, Chris Visser, finally got this on video. Um, so we have it on video now. The toad deflates, and then it can swallow the toad whole. But you ever see a dog or cat grab a toad? It's OK. They foam at the mouth and spit it out, because toads have a poison gland. It's C16, H17, NO3. And if you, hopefully you don't know what that is. It's really close to LSD. 
it's hallucinogenic and makes your heart race. So don't lick toads and don't do drugs. But this guy can take that drug and poison and digest it and it doesn't hurt it one bit. Our dogs and cats foam at the mouth and spit it out. Veterinarians tell me they'll go back the next day and grab another toad because they just, they get totally addicted. So sometimes we have dogs that are totally addicted in the state. But this guy will digest that. So its digestive system, its skull is upturned. That's not just its nose scale. Its skull looks like that to pop those toads up. So its skull, its dentition, its digestive system is maybe frogs and toads. And that's what it does. Now, when it gets scared, it'll rear up. I don't think I can get this one to do it. And flatten its head out like a cobra. Like this. This one won't do it. But when you go to grab it in the wild, what they'll do is they won't bite, they'll roll over, play dead, and vomit. And that's the eastern hognose. I'll just go directly to the plains hognose, which is more common in your area west there. And it eats lizards, mice, and frogs and toads. And it has a black belly. And it has a bit different hog nose. Get it right place here. It also plays dead, but not as readily. And it also fans out like a cobra, but not as readily. Let me get back so you can see. There, that's my third position. And he uses that nose to pop up lizards or little rodents or anything it wants to eat. It will also play dead, but not as readily. And it's found, okay, I'm gonna show you where it's found. It takes five clicks to share this, I don't know why. There we go. So it's not found in the eastern edge, but it's found in the western two-thirds of the state, or actually three-fourths of the state. So it does overlap with the eastern. This is the plain hog nose. Um, yes, my, the plain hog nose we have here at the Nature Center, he also likes to projectile poop. Um, yeah, no. So he, he's very good at that. Um, and, uh, yeah, he, he, he likes to do that kind of stuff. So we have, um, we have somebody that has found a, a hog nose, uh, in their backyard mm -hmm. and Heather, maybe we can ask for more information on what part of the state are you located at, um, for their hog nose they have found. There was also cream. Oh, Heather was in around Lincoln, Nebraska. So what type of possible hog nose would there be one found around Lincoln or is there another cream colored snake that might be more common in her area? There is a more cream colored snake. There's very few hog noses around. The only one that we found around Lincoln would be the Eastern. Okay, um, but it's, I usually found, find them, you know, in counties touching the Missouri and I have found them in South more but I have not found them in Lincoln. So take a picture and send it to me. I'll tell you what it is. It'd be not impossible, but it, the probability of it being a hog nose in Nebraska. However, it could be a pet that someone lost. Um, this week alone, I got three bearded dragons, two turtles, and I think two ball pythons that were found in parks in Lincoln. So, and all those end up here when wildlife control picks them up. You got to get them out of the wild. So our next one is a rare snake. It's the glossy snake. It's one of the rarest snakes in the state. It's kind of my holy grail. This is full grown. It only comes out at night and it lives in sandy areas. The only place, the only time you usually find them is on the road between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. in the morning. So when you want to go find one of these, you got to cruise the roads in the morning. Now, wait till I show you its range. I'll show you why 
it's one I'm trying to figure out about. We found several of them, as you can see, in Dundee County. We found four in Champion, which is almost in Dundee. In 1987, one was found in Thomas County on Highway 83. And in 2016, even though I looked constantly from, from the 80s to 2016, one was found, a gravid female was found on Highway 97, uh, just about 10 miles in Hooker County. And that's just two individuals that were found outside of here. Why aren't they in between? It's not like there's row crops in between. So I have students searching constantly and we can't find them. They're really hard to find. So you ever find this guy, completely white belly, sand, it's glossy snake, sand colored. This is about full grown. Loves to eat lizards. Burrows in the sand. As soon as you put it on sand, it burrows down, only comes out at night to hunt lizards after midnight. So you got to be a nighttime herpetologist to find them. Um, so what's your best guess on why the glossy snake lives only in those smaller areas? I think it's actually all the way in between. We just can't find it. I think it's low numbers. But it isn't like there's a lot of crops. All that area is pretty pristine between, except for maybe Grant. And parts up here and Arthur and Hooker and Grant. I mean, this is Perkins, excuse me. Perkins has a lot of wheat. Um, but why aren't they all the way here? But so does Dundee have a considerable amount of wheat. But all this, the, the substrate, the temperature, everything is the same, all the, across Keith and everything. So I think it should be all the way like this, up into Cherry. So. Well, there's only two herpetologists in the whole state, myself and Dan Fogel, and there's 93 counties. A lot of work to be done. I have to say, I have a lot of students to help, but I have one that was in Sioux County all summer, one that was in uh, Kearney County all summer. Just didn't work. So next. Next one is a fresh caught one and it's a racer. I'm gonna share a picture of it first. I'll tell you why in a minute. I get my cursor where it needs to share. Uh, sorry about the top of my head. Okay. I want to show you something too. Look at that. That's the baby. So the North American used to call the yellow belly racer. Um, when it hatches for the first two or three years of life, looks nothing like the adult. It's one of only two snakes in the state that the baby looks nothing like the adult. Now this snake is like a mood ring. And when you hold the snake, you hold it in the middle, not behind its head. If you hold it behind the head, you will get bit, right? See, look. I'll get you on the screen so you can see it better. Stop sharing here. And let it bite me, I want you to see it. Okay, most snakes I can't, never bite me. Bite me, bite me, these guys, yeah, there you go. Bite me, see. Um, snakes have hardly any teeth, so. Uh, nothing. But if you touch it behind the head or near the head, it's going to bite you. Okay. You, you support in the middle, it won't. Okay. This one's the exodysis. That's why it's biting, which means it's blind. It's going to shed. Now, this snake could be lime green when it's happy and warm. It could be blue green when it's not so warm. It could be gray green, black green. The same snake changes colors. There's no such thing as a blue racer, green racer, black racer in Nebraska. They're all the North American 
racer and they change colors. The same snake changes color. They're not harmful. They eat insects. They're not a constrictor. Even though their name says that, they are not. They grab mice. They grab grasshoppers. They grab frogs. They grab small snakes, rub them on the ground, and eat them whole. Now, one thing, they, when they get scared, they'll jump up in the grass and look around and say, where's the predator? Where's the predator? Because they use vision. That's why this one's very feisty now because it's blind, because it's going through exodysis or shedding. Okay. And it'll go back down and go in a circle. No snake chases a person. For a snake in Nebraska to chase a person, because no snake in Nebraska has territory, it'd be like you chasing a lion and the lion's packing a machine gun. Unless you chase a lion that has a machine gun strapped to it, then a snake may chase you. But that's not going to happen. You're a predator. It's always going to go the other way. You see a snake, no matter what it is, take step 10 foot away, that's out of its line of sight, it will go away. Now, it may come towards you a little because that's where it knows where to hide. But it doesn't want to come to you. You are a predator. Anything that chases a predator dies off in five generations. So every year I got people call me, the snake chased me. Sorry, it's like this now. The snake chased, that just happened in my dreams. I have to run and dive on every snake. Uh, so kids, don't don't try that at home. Okay, don't say, "Well, Dennis let the snake bite him, so we're gonna let our snake bite us." Okay, so he's been doing this for 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 multiple years. Um, so I'm just gonna put that caveat out there. Don't yeah, all, all snakes will bite. You want to know something? I do test and test and test. There's only one bacteria they carry, and they carry no viruses transmittable to mammals. They're completely different than us. They have nucleated blood cells, and they have completely different plasma. So I always say you're better off kissing a snake than petting a dog when it comes to your health. But Don't do oh, that man. either. Don't kiss any snakes, for crying out loud. <laughs> Don't kiss a dog. It's worse. Well... I, I didn't say you could kiss snakes. a dog. You get this temper and your rabies from a dog. You can't get anything from a snake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm just, you know, <laughs> the kids listening out there. Um, let's uh, let's let's not until we get to be uh, 18 years or older. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. You can, you can kiss whatever you want. Yeah. Don't kiss anything until you're 18. This is. <laughs> That's what I keep telling my kids. <laughs> Okay, next is, oh, go ahead one. So that's the racer. That's its range. The whole state. The only reason why there's not dots here is because I haven't got any from there. Next one is related to the racer. It's our fastest snake in the state is the coach whip. And it's only found in the south uh, west corner of the state. It's probably in Hitchcock as well as Hayes, um, but it's been found in Dundee, Chase. I can find them very readily in those areas, uh, but it's mainly a southwest corner of Nebraska snake. And so I'll stop sharing and show you the coach whip. Very long snake. Night, it hunts with its eyes. It also periscopes up. And that, this goes up to 3.8 miles an hour. That's the fastest snake in the state by far. So this one I had to run and dive for. And it's bad because it lives among yuccas and cactus. So, so don't run and dive on, on yuccas and cactus unless you're me. I get the snake, so. And I was gonna say that's got that super long tail. I remember, yep. I remember that. That's like I said, just that long, skinny tail. Let's see how big it is next to me. Coach whip. It's a full-grown one. You're an egg layer. 
They eat mice, frogs, other snakes, they eat carrion, dead things on the road. And again, that southwest corner of the state. I do remember catching one of these with you because you're like, flip over this tin thing and then jump on anything that moves underneath it. Yep. Which is not something I would recommend because there were other friends that lived underneath that as well. So Look at his eye. Look at the eye. Can you see the iris? There we go. It, it's oblong towards the front. And it has a groove on each side of the nose. So almost has binocular vision. It's one of the few snakes, this genus, that uses vision more in olfaction or smell to hunt. So it has a groove so that I can look straight ahead. You see the groove in the, between the eye and the nose? And look at that iris. Um, so we had another question. Is the coach whip the longest snake found in Nebraska, or is that belong to another friend of ours? It belongs to another friend. And I said it right at the beginning. Let's see if anybody remembers that. Uh-oh. The other no. one, the other one's the largest snake in the state by two foot. So that one gets up to six foot, which means the other one gets up to eight foot. But that's the second longest. It's tied for the second one. Okay, this next one is the Speckle King. It has a funny range as well. We have a range in the southeast corner, but we found over seven of them. I, I, years ago, I stationed a student out in Lincoln County, and he found seven of them um, in Lincoln County. And it's the only snake in Nebraska that will eat a rattlesnake that's resistant to rattlesnake venom. Most snakes will never eat a rattlesnake, but this guy can. <laughs> King snake means it eats other snakes. So let's take a look at our speckled king snake. Very strong snake. So it's not unheard of that it could be even farther west. We have a population in Lincoln County and we have a population in the southeast corner. Now they eat all other snakes, but they are resistant they're the only snake in the state that's resistant to rattlesnake venom. So bull snakes won't eat rattles. Bull snakes only eat. Bull snakes outcompete rattlesnakes. So when bull snakes go to an area, the rattlesnakes go, oh, there goes the neighborhood. We got to move. And they move because they outcompete them. They don't hurt them. I find bull snakes and rattlesnakes hibernating together all the time when there's enough food. Yellow belly and yellow and black speckles very strong and round not d-shaped it coils on the other snake suffocates the other snake and then swallows the other snake whole so it's one of the only snakes that likes to eat hot dogs over hamburgers keep on going i'm gonna skip that Okay, we're going to skip some of this stay on time here. I'll show you this one and then we'll show you the map. This one is the Great Plains rat snake. So this is Nebraska's answer to the pet trade corn snake. We don't have corn snakes in Nebraska. We have Great Plains rat snakes. It's kind of a cousin, but it lives in brown soil, not red soil like where corn snakes are from, like Oklahoma or Georgia. That's why corn snakes have that color. Ours live in brown soil like Nebraska, so they're brown. Every once in a while we find one with orange, but that gets eaten right away by predators. 
Where you tell them from other snakes? On the back of the head, I don't know if you can see this, let's see. It has a scream guy on the back. I don't know if you'll be able to see it on this. It's kind of dark. I don't think we can yeah. see this. Yeah. I can't get it. Let's show you its range because it has a different range as well. There, so you can see it. It's, look at its piano like belly. Black and rat snakes have this black and white or yellow belly. It's found along the Kansas border. It's probably all the way over to Dundee, but it's getting pretty far west along the Kansas border. This is a Great Plains rat snake. Okay, let's see who's next. Next we have I'll give you this. Um, so while Dennis is getting another snake ready, um, I know we're getting close to that 730 time frame. So for those of you that would like to hang out with us a little longer and see some more snakes, you're more than welcome to. If you've got a time crunch and you've got a hot date to go to tonight, we appreciate you, you coming. Um, I wanted to say that before some of you, if some of you had to leave or it is your bedtime. Um, so thanks for that. I think Dennis is going to continue a little bit, but I just wanted to say if you had to leave at that 7.30 Mountain Time, 8.30 Central Time, let me clarify. We appreciate you coming tonight. So, Okay, so this next one I'm going to show you is the Black Rat Snake, also called the Western Rat Snake. It's the, also the set, one of the tied for second longest in the state at six foot. And even though it's not found, it's only found in the eastern part of the state, um, the reason I want to show it to you is our only arboreal snake, what does arboreal mean? Arbor means trees, so it lives in trees. It's the only snake in Nebraska that lives in trees, so I can easily just do this to it, hold it by its tail and say, point it to go up. You can get it to go all the way up. End of the day, lazy, up. Back here, see how long it is. Yeah. But again, like to eat baby birds out of bird and bird eggs out of nest, and this one hangs out in trees. You can do it. You can go up. You can go. You can climb any tree. You can climb a sycamore. You can climb an, uh, definitely a bur oak. You can climb a maple, an elm. It just puts its body in between the the tree uh, bark. And it climbs on itself sometimes. It hangs out on branches. There it goes. It's trying. It's a little cooler in here. It's at the end of the day, so it doesn't have quite the energy. But it's trying to get up to my other finger. Uh, it's getting tired. Okay, this next one. Get to the next picture. Oh, I just wanted to show you real quick. I'll share this with the black rat. I'm going a little fast here, forgot about this. The black rat is the only other, the second of the two snakes in the state, that when it hatches, the baby looks nothing like the adult for the first two years. So here's a black rat when it's hatchling. And so the first two years of life, it looks like that. And again, it's where there's trees in Nebraska. So that's where it's found in Nebraska. Next one, it's found across the whole state and is the largest snake in the state. It's also the most common, found in all 93 counties very regularly. Um, it's the snake I find dozens of every year. 
And it's a bull snake. This one's only seven foot, a little over seven foot. It's not a climber, so you have to hold it. And this is our bull snake. Bull snake's the only snake in the state with a pointed rostrum or nose. Bull snake's the only snake in the state that can dig their own hole in soft soil. Every other snake uses the hole of another animal. Okay, rattlesnakes use prairie dog holes and kangaroo rat holes. Garter snakes use rotted uh, stumps and cracks in the soil or rocks. Only bull snakes can make their own hole. So if you say something is a snake hole, it's got to be a bull snake hole. What's the biggest bull snake you have ever seen? Uh, I've caught, this one's almost, this one's seven, four inches. I got, I caught one once that was seven, six. But the record is actually um, eight, eight, six, eight and a half. That was a long time ago. Now, this thing wraps around its prey. It mainly only eats warm blooded prey. It will not wrap around anything that is bigger than a pound or two, because it won't wrap around anything that it cannot swallow whole. Snakes do not wrap around the neck. They only wrap around the chest of, of their prey. And they squeeze, and they don't really suffocate it as much as causing the blood from the heart to rush into the brain. And the mouse or rodent or baby rabbit dies of brain hemorrhaging. That's faster than asphyxiation. So it's a misnomer to think a, a, a constrictor goes around the neck, never. A constrict, even a ball python or a boa can't strangle a person around the neck. It can't get that tight. It has to be around the chest. I had to use that in a court case 15 years ago to acquit a snake. I was going to say, I don't, I don't want to know. But um, the other question was, you said that the bull snakes dig their own homes. Will a hog nose also dig a hole, or is it? No, it'll hole? just pop up the food. Okay, with his nose or skull that's adapted for okay. that. Now, this is a seven and almost half foot bull snake. I gotta support his body. Let's see if I can do this under the camera. No, I don't think so. The teeth are only a sixteenth of an inch. So when a bull snake's going like this with its mouth open, walk back, but it's all bluff. There's nothing there. I can never get bull snakes to bite me or I will show you, but bull snakes never bite me. They just want to scare you. So they'll rattle their tail and they'll strike with their mouth open and drop. Walk the other way and let it go the other way. Because it swallows its food, food whole, it does not need teeth. No snake chews. Every snake in the world must swallow its food whole. So it has to subdue it first. So uh, we had a, a question whether you have names for your snakes. I mean, no, never. They all have electronic tag in them. And actually, I have 612 rattlesnakes in Cherry County and about 300 out in your way that have electronic tags. Yeah, I, I just put an electronic like chip in them. So when I scan them, it tells me last time they ate, the day I caught them and everything about their health check. If I find them out in the wild, I can just run the scanner across, hit a button, and it'll tell me last time I found that snake. Do the ones in the lab have any affectionate names? No, no, I, don't, I won't let my students name anything. I want to put pit tags and name my offspring for our offspring male seven six eight, but I lost that battle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the snakes that I have at the nature center do have lovely, lovely um, names. So that's just um, to help us remember some of their cool adaptations. So that was a, a yeah. really good question that we had. Okay, we got one more snake. Guess which one it is. Found out your way. 
Does it make noise? Well, they all can make some noise. Does it make noise with its tail? Yeah. Is it a, okay. Well, I, uh, yeah, they've got some people making some guesses on online here, so. How's that go for you? All right. Now we're talking. Now, just real quickly, this position means I'm scared, I'm trying to look bigger. It cannot hardly strike from this position. This lower position, with its head tucked underneath and rattling its tail, is I'm scared, please go the other way. When it's curled up with its head on top, that's when it can strike over half, a little over half its body length. And that's a strike position for food. So when you come across one, walk the other way. But if it looks like this, it's telling you, please leave me alone. If it looks like this, it's saying, please leave me alone. That's where it's found in Nebraska. Now it's more common from this point west, but they could be found anywhere from this line west and north. Look at that for a second. Do, 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 do. This is easier. I've got the, an average female. Males in this species are a little bigger. Um, our male is almost record size. It's over four foot. So all the 1,500 rattlesnakes I've caught in Nebraska and weighed and measured and put tags in. Um, the average length of a male is about a meter, which is about three foot. The average length of a female is a bit shorter than three foot. It's about two and three quarters. And so this is an average female. Now they could be greener. If you see a snake and you don't 100% know, especially in your area, if it's a rattlesnake or not, what do you do? You take 10 steps back. If you only take foot steps. If you take three foot steps, then you only have to take four or five. But you move 10 foot away. You can do it backwards, you can do it forward, you can do it fast, you can do it slow, it doesn't matter. You see the snake, you walk away. Here's the deal. In Nebraska and the whole rest of the United States, 75% of the people who get bit by rattlesnakes are trying to catch it or kill it. So the most dangerous thing you can do for you and your family is to go towards it and try to kill it. Don't say, well, I'm going to kill it because it's near my children. No, teach your children to walk the other way. Because if you go to kill it, you're liable to get bit, and that's not good for your children either. Never, ever, ever go towards a rattlesnake to kill it or anything. Walk the other way, always. Teach young people. When they see it, walk the other way. Everybody will be safe. No snakes have ever killed a person in Nebraska if they went to a hospital. I have the records back 100 years. We don't know about people who never go to a hospital. No one in Nebraska who's been bit by a rattlesnake in Nebraska has, even, has ever even lost a digit. If you do accidentally get bit because you stuck your hand in an irrigation pipe where one was hiding, do nothing. Do not put ice on it. Do not cut and suck it. That makes it worse. Call 911 and get to a hospital as fast as possible. Don't panic. They'll give you the new Crofab. And everybody I've seen who's had Crofab, the new stuff, 
they come out without a scar. So, so we had a question, a question about, um, have you seen any rattlesnakes without a rattle? Yes. I, um, I have found two and Dan has found one in Nebraska. I've also caught a rattlesnake in Mitchell that had no pattern. It was cream color, the whole snake. The pattern was rattlesnake. So there's always mutations. Now, there are a lot more without rattles where they're allowed to hunt them, like in Texas and Oklahoma where they have roundups because they catch them by hearing them. And the ones that develop no rattle survive and have young with no rattle. So the reason why we're getting snakes with no rattle is because we're killing them. So we're, we're actually making it worse for us. Right now, they warn us. If we keep killing the ones with rattles, they won't be able to warn us. So stop killing them. Rattlesnakes don't hurt people. People hurt rattlesnakes. So we had another question about snakes that spit. Are there snakes that spit in Nebraska? Snakes that sit? Spit. S P I T spit. No, no. None of them spit. No. I do occasionally when I'm talking too loud. Well, I'm pretty sure I just did right there too. So thankfully nobody else got to see it. So Okay. Guess what time it is? Oh no. Questions. And before you type in your question, please read the disclaimer. Yeah. So we, we've had some, some good questions come in. Um, we've had a question um, specifically on garter snakes. Um, okay. Know about do different regions have different colors uh, of, of, of snakes? Yes and no. You will get populations in one region. Like I know in the Benson area of Douglas County in Omaha, there's a whole population of blue ones. And we've gotten a lot of albino ones right here in Lincoln. And there's actually calico ones in Hall County. Um, so what it is is those mutations um, go rampant in, in our islands, especially when we have habitat destruction. Cool. And then, which is the rarest color, do you think? Blue, albino, calico, what are you thinking? Calico is like that. I've only caught and seen maybe six calicos. I have an albino right now, right from Lincoln. So albino, we have an albino bull snake. We have an albino, you know, on Saturday, we had an albino uh, toad here. We get all those weird things that are caught out. We don't, these aren't bred. We won't let them breed um, because they're a mutation. So we had another question. We talked about the largest snake, but what is the smallest snake you have found? The smallest snake in the state is a worm snake. Uh, it only grows to about six inches, found in the southeast corner. It eats termites and it's found in the rocks. And it's a mob color underneath and a slate blue gray on top. And again, six inches full grown. Now, since you're talking about that, the ring neck is also a small snake found in this size of state. And our ring neck laid eggs in June and just an hour ago, let's see if I can get this, the egg hatched. Yes. If I can get, get it around so you can see it. Well, Mazel tov. Um Oh, how big is that? That looks like an earthworm, smaller than an earthworm. Smaller than an earthworm. Oh my goodness. I don't know if you can see. It's so hard, it keeps moving. Oh, that, hey, oh, hey, all right. He went for a little- There it is. Oh, hi, little one. Oh. So small, I can't, I don't want to pinch it. Right, right. Here, oh, let's try, job, little one. let's try this. Here's its brother in eggs. The brothers haven't come out of the egg yet, or her sister, I don't know. See if I can do this to the camera. Oh, there it is. Okay. 
Oh, wow. Get my hand out of the way of the penny. There we go. Isn't that just the cutest little thing? That hatched at five o'clock. Well, happy birthday. Put it back. Um, so we had another question. How long will snakes live uh, in general? 12 to 20 years in general, if they make it past the first year. Okay. Um, what do the students do in your lab? What fun things do you have them doing? They do what projects they want to do. Or they work a lot on conservation. Um, well, do come around. This is Tu Lee. She's been handing me things. She's one of the students. You can say hi. Hi. Does he have you doing weird stuff or is it cool? Um, it's cool because I love snakes and he let me uh, clean all the snake cages like every day. Oh, well that does not, that doesn't sound like fun. I mean, I clean snake cages, but that's not, that's not, that's not fun. Well, what other fun stuff do you do? Snake. Okay. <laughs> No, um, I have one student working in Sioux and Kimball in Sioux County on horn lizards this summer. So that, that was Nick, and he, because we're trying to get DNA for as many horn lizards, we, we catch him, get DNA, a blood sample, and then let him go, way measure and let him go. I have another student working on frogs, uh, tree frogs. I have two students working on salamanders. And pretty much I let the students tell me what they want to do, and then we talk about it. And um, you can, I don't know if you can see behind me, this, my walls of the lab, there's li literally almost 56 posters from students who have graduated. Um, so I have another garter snake question. They want to know, do they came back to the same year and hibernate? And do they always find the, the same mate? Or, or what? we're okay. very interested in garters. Okay, garter snakes, yes. Once they find a good place to hibernate, they will always go there and their offspring will go there. So you get big congregations. Now, do they find the same mate? Maybe, maybe not. But garter snakes, okay. Garter snakes have what we call, as soon as they come out of hibernation, the female lets out a pheromone, an odor. Every male within 30 feet rushes to her. She will be mated by, in our DNA looking at it, each female has babies from 2.3 fathers. So somewhere between two and three fathers. So since she only has one litter a year, and only mates once a year, she can spread her genes properly by having uh, mating with more than one for that litter. And so it's really the male that gets there first, second, and third, that are the father. So she has lots of boyfriends is what you're saying. Okay. Yes. She and and, and biologically, this is great. I mean, mm. it's, it's, it's perfect because you get to spread your genes for the best rigor and everything. You know, it's, you know for us, we have to get married, divorce, married, divorce to properly spread our genes. But wow. Garter Snake knows how to do it right off the bat. Well, and I enjoy sneaker males. And garter snakes. So those are yeah. those are my favorite. I always root for the underdog, the one that acts like a, a girl. Girl, yeah. Able to squeak right in there. So, um, we we have a question. What is the most unusual snake you have found? Well, probably the in the world. Uh, the it's just the most that you have found. So. Okay. Um, it was a thread snake. In the Caribbean, Ooh. had like an orange, bright orange head and the bright orange tail, and it was blue in between. Cool. In the rainforest, in Nebraska, my holy grail for a long time was Cantilla nigriceps, which I think Amanda, you were with me when we found one at N. Here's Reservoir. It's one of the rarest snakes. I, the I remember, yes, because I flipped over a rock and I said, there's a something. And he said, grab it. <laughs> and I didn't know what it was until um, M. Dennis told me what it was. 
that it's only as big as a worm and it eats baby centipedes and it's only found in the extreme southwest corner of the state. And that's what it looks like. That's one of the rarest snakes in Nebraska. All Other right. questions? I'm, I'm looking through our feed. We're finding some different things. Um, we had, we had a question about a dog getting bit um, and lost all of its hair on the head and neck and wanted to know whether the, if you knew if the hair would come back from that dog that was bit by a snake. Well, what kind of snake? Well, for the, the only thing that I ever have seen cause a problem for a dog is a rattlesnake. Yep, and, and that's what they're saying. It was a, a rattlesnake. Yeah. I, I would say, you know, I have most of my, I teach vet students and I, I have a lot of friends that are vet students. Um, I would say talk to a vet, that's unusual. I, most dogs come out of it. There is a vaccination for dogs made by Red Rock Pharmaceuticals. You get your dog a vaccination once a year and it can get bit by rattlesnake and it says, oh, I'm fine. Um, but them say that, it is fine. Um, they don't have vaccination, well, they, FDA won't. It's a long story. They can have it for people, but the pharmaceutical company doesn't think there's enough profit in it to make it for people, test it for people. Um, so another question we had is that people are wanting to know if you were to get a snake that is a pet, maybe what, which one would make the best pet or where would you? Um... Okay, I would say, I'm always say go for something that's native. Garter snakes, yes, they smell a little. They came down fairly well. They eat worms. They eat insects. They're okay. If you really want something from the pet shop that you don't need to tame down, um, corn snakes are the easiest. Uh, they're, make sure you get a normal corn snake, not an inbred one that's a funky color. Just a normal corn snake. They're, they're the least expensive. They eat frozen thawed mice, but it's better to feed them live mice. I published on that. It's so much better. You never have to worry about the mouse biting the snake. That's a misnomer. If the snake gets bitten, it heals immediately. So I was wondering if you could touch on when snakes are born or hatched again. I know you mentioned this is your Christmas sure. time. In Nebraska. Yes. All snakes lay their eggs. There are egg layers. They'll lay, they'll lay their eggs from in May to the beginning of June. And now you start in April. Those will hatch sometime from August 1st all the way to about end of September. Those are live birth mate in April or May and give live birth from end of July, like the garter snakes, up until the end of, or the middle of October, like the rattlesnakes. So no snakes are born or hatched in the spring. So if you find a small baby in the spring, it made it through the winter. So um, we had another question about dry bites in rattlesnakes. Yes, um, in the United States right now, it's about 50-50. This means that if you get bit by a rattlesnake, and it doesn't matter where in the United States, the, the probability is that half those bites will be a dry bite. Venom is to secure prey. Venom is a digestive juice. It's not defense. It is accidentally used as a defense, okay, by the snake. If the snake is going up, it can't decide whether venom comes out or not. That's another misnomer. It's hydraulics and a lot of different things. It has to engage, okay? It can't say, I want venom to come out. I don't want venom to come out. If the, if the fangs engage properly and hit the right tension, venom comes out. If the, the fangs are not engaged and don't hit the right tension, you get no venom. If they're going down on a prey, it's more likely that venom's gonna come out. If they're going up to scare you, okay, it's more likely no venom will be liberated. 
And then we're asking about parental care um, when the snake is in, in North America. No snake in North America has parental care. So they lay their eggs and never see their eggs hatch, or they drop their babies as they're going down the road. Yeah, well, I, I know the feeling. Now, ah. there is snakes, and there is snakes that have territory, not in Nebraska. So okay. a snake in Nebraska has nothing to protect but its own body. So it's never going to protect the baby. It's never going to protect its place. It's only to protect itself. That's why if you walk away, it goes away. Um, the other one was wondering if you could tell us about your tagging, like how do the pit tags work? Where do they go? Any fun details you have about GPS tagging or, or pit tagging? Well, you're talking about hours of, of each. Let me see. Okay. Because I, I know that it goes under the skin. It goes into muscular, actually. Yes, yes. And where do you normally put your tags at? Well, see, it could be almost any place. I put them where the dorsal scales meet the ventral scales, 25 scales up from the coital opening. And that's just what I do and what Dan does in Nebraska. So when we grab a snake and we go to scan it, we can find where we put them. You can put them almost any place on the, in the muscle, in the sheep muscle. You can put them from the neck down to the tail of the sheep muscle. I, we just like 25 ventral scales up because it's easy. You can hold the snake and twist it, even a rattlesnake. I can hold its head and, and hold its back end. Don't ever try this. You know, I'm venom certified and, and inject the tag. I can, you know, so. Um, what's you the can, you can't see, you can't oh, see the tags. The tags are about the size of a grain of rice. Right. Yeah. And then you use a thing that kind of is like a, a grocery store scanner. You scan it over yeah, that. Hand scanner. Yep. Yep. Um, so what is the longest living live snake in Nebraska? Uh, hard to say. I would, I think though they're slow growing, probably live longer. So like the milk snakes, um, we don't have a real lot of data. So I, I'm more, I'm very scant data. Um, so we don't have a lot of ro robust data, but in generally it's those that are slow growing and smaller that live longer. So if I had a guess, in Nebraska, I would say the milk snakes. Okay. Um, and our milk snake is one of our oldest in the lab, 20 years old. You, you've created a following here and they want to know if they can follow you on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. So, um, well, I had that stuff and it, it just overwhelmed me. So we have my website um, where you can get to the lab and everything and you could text me and talk to me through that. But I don't, I had problems with Facebook getting hacked into and people changing things. And so I didn't do that. I'll probably start Twitter again. I had that for a while and I had, we had problems with that. So right now is you have the website I gave you um, and we try to update that. It tells you, you go to about the lab, it talks about the lab um, and we try to update that all the time and you can send pictures to that when you see things uh, and we go that way. And you can always email me and that my email is in that website. Okay. Uh, another question we had was about feeding um, live, um, live prey. Yes. And how do you make sure it doesn't fight back or hurt the snake? If it hurts the snake, something's wrong with the snake. Well, I, my snake is not the brightest snake in in the world, and. Um, well, but then it, it'll learn. Okay. It'll learn. The thing is, you only, okay, so we sneak the food in on one side where the snake isn't looking. We never feed the snake directly because then it assumes your hand is food. Right. So we, we run a feed, we open one, we kind of tap one side of the cage, and the snake goes over there and looking what's going on, and we sneak the live mouse or rat or live pinkies on the other side. Then it searches them. That's the best enrichment. Moving stuff around the cage brings up stress hormones. Putting dead food in the cage showed some stress hormones rose. Putting live food in the cage, stress hormones fell. Huh. So the best thing for the snake is live food. The other thing is when it eats 
fly food. It gets the stomach content. Now a snake has no enzymes to break down carbohydrates, vegetation, grain. The mouse does, okay? So when it eats a live mouse, it gets the enzymes in the mouse's gut with that food and therefore it can get the nutrients out of the vegetation through the enzymes of the mouse's gut as it's digesting the mouse. Better health for the snake. Two, every year I have to try to help usually ball pythons that someone fed a frozen thawed and didn't make sure that that center of that frozen thawed rat or mouse was 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The body temperature of a rat or a mouse is about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. If you don't make sure with a meat thermometer several times that the exact center of that rodent is not 100 degrees, it can stop the enzymes from working in the gut and start to cause an ulcer in the animal. And every year I get five snakes that someone's been feeding frozen thawed that have an ulcer. And let me tell you, I'm only 50-50 on trying to save them before it goes septic and kills them. I've never known a snake, and we've been keeping snakes here for 20 years, that's gotten injured by live food. I've seen many snakes that have died from frozen thawed. So we're, we're still on the, the feeding track, but somebody um, has a, a garter snake and they're wanting to know um, diet. Do you feed it fish live? Do you feed crickets, uh, worms? Yes. What's the best? Very. Worms, crickets, and if it's a common, throw a couple minnows in its water dish. Okay. Okay. And uh, another question was, what was the first snake you ever caught? Uh, I'm 60 some years old. Uh, it was back in Connecticut. It was, okay, I'll, I'll go back. So when I was nine years old, first day of third grade, this is as far back as I can remember about herpetology, the teacher the first day of school said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I raised my hand and said, I want to be a herpetologist. And I vividly remember the teacher running to a dictionary to look it up. Look it up. So I wanted to be a herpetologist from when I was younger than nine. Um, so it's probably a black rat. They were very common in our yard. We lived on an acreage. I got in trouble for bringing home the copperhead. <laughs> but that was my mother. Robert, yeah. Copperhead, uh, I won't say this on. <laughs> they're, they're not like a rattlesnake. They're 111th LD50. So. Oh, okay. You no, know, stay away from them. But they're okay. not, they're only found in one fourth of a county in Nebraska, the southern one fourth of Beatrice, uh, south of Beatrice in Gage County. It's the only place you can find copperheads in Nebraska. Well, my friends, I think that we're kind of um, winding down on our questions today. We've got thoughts on venomous snake husbandry, and then we've got one more other question that's about uh, bearded okay. rat. Uh, Venomous snake husbandry? Yes. What are you, Josh? No, asked never, about. never. And actually, people don't realize this. There is a law in the state of Nebraska. It's not by wildlife control or your department, Fishery and Wildlife, or um, game parks. It's not by the local uh, humane society. It's under the state health code. It says no one shall hold a venomous snake or animal without a permit that shows they have ample security and insurance. And I think it's like a million dollars worth. Ooh. So I have, of course, blanket permits because I'm part of the university and I have nothing at my house. Everything's in double security. Every one of my venomous snakes, every cage, has two locks, a key lock and a combination lock. There's two steel doors to get to them. And there's alarms on the doors. The doors open, alarms go off. So 
to keep a venomous snake is against the law and very, very, very dangerous. I teach venom certification. I just got finished with one student. It takes 100 hours of teaching. I've been handling these snakes, my, you know, venomous snakes since I was young when I wasn't supposed to. Um, I've never been bit by a venomous snake, even though I handle them every day. Um, and it's because I'm always a little bit scared. As soon as you're not scared, you stop. Right. So my thing is a person should not have a, a venomous snake unless you have the credentials and the permits. Right. For you. Because if, if, if that venomous snake gets out or bites someone, then they'll come down on you. Um, they're not going to come down on you if they don't know about you and they're not going to look for you. But as soon as someone gets bit then in your house, that's, you know, that's a million dollar lawsuit. Right. So we have a, one more question. It's about what the difference is between a legless lizard and a snake. One's a lizard, one's a snake. Okay. So have, <laughs> okay. They're completely different animals. This, okay. The easiest thing is that we do have a legless lizard in Nebraska, uh, only in three counties, Franklin, Harlan, and Webster. The tail is half the snake. So you notice on a snake, or half the lizard. A snake, the tail is just like the last quarter or less. In a legless lizard, the vent is halfway through the body. It's half tail. The other thing is, it holds its head up like this, and it has ear holes. Snakes have no ears, and it has eyelids. Snakes have no eyelids. So that's the easy. They oh, both have forked tongues, so we can't go by that. Well, everyone, there was a lot of great questions coming tonight. So I want to thank you all for joining us here for Snakes of Nebraska. That website, um, again, I can list that on there um, for Dennis. Or maybe Dennis can pull it up faster than I can I'm pull it up real quick but right now. If you, if you have any questions or anything like that, feel free to, to pop on over and, and submit those directly to Dennis. Um, again, we appreciate you joining us here today. Hopefully you all have a wonderful evening. Hopefully we didn't keep you up too much past your bedtime here. For uh, okay. Western Nebraska, we're just 8 o'clock, but it's past my bedtime on, on Central Nebraska time. Oh, so, there's the website. So, uh, again, we want to thank you all for coming. Um, thanks for joining us here tonight, and um, we look forward to 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 seeing you again when we're able to do um, in-person programs. But um, this was this was great. Uh, maybe we'll put thank the you turtles so up in Nebraska someday. Oh, there we go. We've got a we've got a we've got a looker out here at the nature center, the Blandings turtle. So thanks to you all. I know that Blandings turtle well. Like, didn't I do stable isotopes on that one? Yes, yes. So thank you all for coming. Hopefully you have a wonderful night, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.